Hi there and welcome back to my channel. This is Sean, The Honest Book Reviewer. In this video, it's all about January. All the books I read for the month of January 2024. Let's go through them one by one from the first book to the last book of the month. Let's start now. The first book I read is Homecoming, written by Kate Morton. It's an historical mystery set in Sydney and Adelaide, Australia, and it has past and present timelines. So the past timelines happen in Adelaide, and most of the present timeline happens in Sydney, with a little bit in Adelaide towards the end. It wasn't a very gripping book, not for the whole book anyway. I like the start of the book, that was good, but then it just meanders along for a big chunk of the middle of the book. It just goes nowhere really. It's quite slow, quite tedious, takes you a lot to get through it, a bit of a slog. And doesn't add much to the mystery in that middle section either. The past narrative chapters were good. I liked the characters and the setting. It hooked me into that narrative. It's a present narrative I had issues with. The present narrative was just going nowhere. It was all about family drama more than historical mystery. That's what it felt like to me in that present narrative. Towards the end of the book, it does get a bit better. You know, the mystery starts to become more solidified in the story. You start to unravel that mystery, what the characters do anyway. And I enjoyed that because it all made sense towards the end. It was a good mystery at the end as well. It was quite complex. It was, you know, red herrings going on from that past narrative. A lot of things going on to bring that conclusion at the end. So beginning, the end, and those past narrative chapters were good. The rest of the story, not so much. Then I read... West Heart Kill by Dan McDorman. Now I'm not sure why I read this, so Coleridge Girl from Pick Your Pop Cultural Poison read this before I did, and didn't give a very good review on this. And maybe I should have listened to that more and decided not to read this, because it wasn't that good. But it could have been good. This book could have been a great book. So it had a good mystery, it had good characters, had a lot of good things going on in the book. Just the way it's written. So it's written like it's more a look what I can do rather than I've written a good book, a good mystery, and here it is. Enjoy it. It's more ego driven, I think, on the author's side than anything else in this book. We have sections where the author is telling the reader how they should feel, how they should react to the book. How does that make sense in a story? You're a reader, your feelings and reactions, while the author is trying to drive them in the way they build the story. They shouldn't tell you how to feel or react to the book. That was ego-driven to me in the author. Then we had sections where the author's schooling the reader on the history of mysteries, on the history of terms definitions in the mystery genre. That was odd to me as well because it just pulls you out of the story. And it's like you're sitting there in a lecture. The author's lecturing you on what he deems to be you know, the most important things about the mystery genre. And the biggest thing of all in this story, we had overuse of breaking down the fourth wall. It's there constantly through the story. Now, I don't mind if a book does that you know, once or twice in the book. That's okay. There are other books that have done that once or twice. But those books who do that once or twice don't then have this ego-driven you know, power trip on the side of the author that this book does. So a lot about this book just was ego-driven to me. It ruins the story, pulls you out of the story too much. And it's a shame because the structure of the mystery is good. It's got a great mystery. It's got good characters. It's got a good setting. This book could have been so much better if it was just a standard novel, a standard mystery. Maybe a little bit of you know, creative things going on in the story. I don't mind. I mean, this has switch of point of view in the narrative. I don't mind that at all. That's good in a story sometimes. So little things like that make sense. They work in a book. But when it's so ego-driven, when the author's there saying, hey, look what I can do, aren't I clever? Rather than just presenting this great book, this great story, that's what I have issues with. Then I switched to a cozy mystery and I read Dead on Target, written by R.W. Green and M.C. Beaton. R.W. Green is writing these books now. In this series and the Hamish Macbeth series, M.C. Beaton sadly passed away a few years ago. This book is okay. It's not the best book in the series. It's quite violent for an Agatha Raisin book, though. For a cozy mystery, it's quite violent. A lot of danger going on in this story. The mystery itself is okay. The characters are okay. But there's kind of something missing in there as well. It's almost like the author's going for more shock value in that danger, in that violence, than giving us you know, a true kind of feel of this cozy mystery series that we're used to in this series. So I enjoyed the book. 
I will read more in this series when more books are published, I hope they are, but I just want Agatha to go back to what she's really like. There is still growth for Agatha in this series, and that's so good because it's the 34th book in the series. And after that many books, you wonder how much can a character grow, but Agatha is, and also changes in her life as well. It seems like she's ready to settle down a bit in her love life. It's great to see after so many books in this series, after so many times where she thinks she's found the one, you know, she's found somebody who she wants to spend her life with, and it doesn't work out for her. It's happened quite a few times in this series. Looks like this time it may work. And at the end of this book, there's a hint what the next book will be. That's very interesting, because if it's true, it'll be a setting we've never seen in this series before. Totally new setting, Agatha in a new environment, very enclosed environment as well, from that hint at the end of this book. Be interesting to see if it happens in the next book in the series. Then switching things around again, I read Bright Young Women, written by Jessica Knoll. This is a very interesting story, it's very gripping, it will challenge you. So basically it's about a serial killer, and it's about the women who are the victims of this killer in the past and the survivors in the future. So it's written in split timeline narrative. So in the past narrative, it's set in the 70s. Now, I think that setting feels so genuine, feels so real. I can't really tell for sure. You know, I wasn't born until towards the end of the 70s, but it was a genuine feel, I think, in this book. It just felt so real. And a lot of that comes down to the attitudes of people, of characters in the book in that timeline, especially towards women. I mean, we have, you know, characters in this book that are, they're spoken down to all the time just because they're women. They're not believed, not trusted. They're thought of as being weak-minded, weak-willed, all that sort of thing, easily confused. You get that from all different characters in that timeline, including police officers and detectives. It was interesting to see and just made that 70s feel feel real because you can imagine that happening in the 70s. And the characters, the main character, Pamela, in one of those timelines in the 70s, just was brilliant in my view. The best character in the book. That comes down to her reactions and her feelings to how she's treated by men primarily in that timeline. She's trying to get through to them, trying to make them understand that she's clever, she's strong, she knows what she's talking about, she can be trusted, but nobody will believe her, it seems, in that timeline. So I enjoyed that in the book. The present day timeline was good, but not as strong to me as the past timeline. The past timeline was much better, much more going on. I felt more real in that past timeline. Still a good book to read. I think read this. You know, it won't be an easy read for you, I think. There are some graphic scenes in there. There are challenging things going on in the story. But it just feels so real. Just read it for the past timeline alone. That's my view anyway. Then I read The Villa, written by Rachel Hawkins. Now, I didn't really like this that much. It is split in past and present narrative. Both narratives take place in the same location, which is a villa in Italy. And both are about kind of like this mystery from the past. So in the past timeline, we have this group of artists and musicians staying at this villa. One of them dies. And it's presumed that another one there was guilty of murder. In the present timeline, we have these two so-called best friends. And I say so-called because they don't really feel like friends at all sometimes in that present timeline. They feel more like enemies, like combatants, than friends. Anyway, they're staying at the villa, and they know about this murder that happened all those years ago at the same villa. They're both authors. One's you know, into self-help books. One's into cozy mysteries. That was interesting to me, having a character who writes cozy mysteries, because I do like them. But this one who writes cozy mysteries, she's you know, more into the history of the villa. And then she wants to write a book about that. She wants to write a book about the history, about the crime that happened all those years ago, and about just her time at the villa and how that history makes her feel. So she's writing about that, and then the other friend decides she wants in on that action. She wants to help her. And it's almost like this fight happens. She's trying to pressure to get into this book idea. And the other friend doesn't want that. She wants it for herself. So cue all these other things that are going on in the story. There's one big event that happens towards the end. I'm not going to say what it is. But what happens after that big event doesn't make sense for one of the characters. It's so out of character. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, you read it and you wonder, why would somebody behave that way? Why would somebody accept certain things and then choose that path, that direction? Doesn't make sense to me. Very strange way of writing 
a thriller like that. And for the whole book, it's not that thrilling. Even though this is a thriller, it's not that thrilling. It's quite boring. It's quite you know low key for a thriller. And it's not a slow burn thriller. I see some reviews referring to this as a slow burn book. It's not really. There's no tension in the story. There's no slow build up of tension in the book to really make this a slow burn thriller. Then I read I Know Who You Are, written by Alice Feeney. The January was a bit of Alice Feeney month for me. I read three books by this author. This book was my least favourite of those three. Still a good story in parts, and it is split in past and present narrative. So many books now are split in past and present narrative. It seems almost every book you pick up in the thriller mystery genre, especially modern books, have that split narrative. The past narrative in this book is a bit tedious. The chapters are a bit long. They repeat certain things. It was a bit of a slog in that past narrative sometimes, and it does pull you out of the present narrative, which is a shame, because parts of that present narrative are quite good. We have a disappearance of the main character's husband very early on in the story. I think it may even be the first chapter or the second chapter it happens. And that whole mystery surrounding that disappearance is so good. He disappears without a trace. He disappears and leaving everything behind. His money, his wallet, his car, his possessions, everything is there in the house. Just he's gone. So what happened to her husband? That mystery is so confusing, it's so gripping, it will make you think about that through the story. That's probably the best thing about the book. Some of the characters aren't that good. We have a detective who is just written quite strangely in my view. Kind of just in every scene, this detective character is kind of smirking. It's kind of, you know, giving the suggestion she knows something. But she doesn't really. So I don't know why this smirking happens in every scene with that detective in this book. Then the main character, she's an actress, and she's had this past that's been very traumatic for her. And what happened is, she's kind of bottling up her feelings in that past narrative of hers. That's who we read in the past narrative. So you can understand why she's very closed off, why her reactions to everything, including the disappearance of her husband, are just closed off and subdued a bit. You can understand that. But in this type of book, you need some sort of reaction. So while I understand that her reactions suit her character, just felt downplayed to me in the story. I just needed more emotion in the story from that character, but I can understand why it's not there, if that makes sense. And then I read Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney. This is a great book. It's brilliant. It's so twisty, so surprising, so shocking. I love the setting. It's set in this converted church in you know, a remote area in the Scottish Highlands, in a blizzard, in a snowstorm. And that setting is very atmospheric, almost feels very gothic, especially when you tie in the church. The church itself is converted into this living area, like an apartment, like a house, and it just feels so dark and so gloomy. There's not many lights in it. And when they've got this snowstorm, you know, locking these people in, this husband and wife, in this converted church, that whole feel of it, it's very dusty in areas as well, like it's not very kept up very much. It just feels so foreboding. It feels so sinister in that setting. And I enjoyed that a lot. And then the characters as well. The characters are very well written. All the characters in the story are well written. One of the characters, the husband, he has a condition where he can't read people's faces. He can't recognize people's faces. That's a blur to him. And having that in a story like this, it was interesting. It makes you wonder, how will it work in a story? But it does work. It works very well. Because he has to kind of interpret people's other body language, you know, apart from the face. Interpret their voice, how they speak all that sort of thing, rather than look at their face and know whether they're lying or telling the truth or whatever. So I like that in the story. It's got so many twists and turns. They all make sense. They all work very well. Everything in this book, I think, is brilliant. Then for something completely different, I read Bad Astronauts, written by Grady Hendrix. So Grady Hendrix is usually a horror writer, and in his books, he usually tries to inject humor. Sometimes in the horror books, it works. Sometimes it doesn't. For me, it depends how much humour he's putting into those books. This book is more sci-fi, it has a lot of humour, and for some reason, it works. With these horror books, when it has too much, I get a bit turned off by those books. But in this book, it's okay. A lot of this book actually felt like South Park to me. It felt like I was watching a South Park episode. I haven't watched it for a long time, but in the past I did, and it felt like that to me in this book. It's very funny, it's very fast moving, and it's a novella, not very long at all good characters in there and just has this great feel to it 
It's all about people working together to overcome a big challenge. That's kind of all about community and family and how even strangers can form a community very quickly to work towards you know, achieving something, to beating something that feels insurmountable. That's what it feels like in this story. I enjoyed it a lot. Not the best book by the author, but it just was a fun read. It's a book you can get there to sit back, you know, turn off, relax, and just read it and enjoy the ride. The next book I read was Echo Lake, written by Joan Sawyers. One word comes to mind with this book, serviceable. You don't hate it, you don't love it, it's just okay, it's average. It gets you there. It's kind of like a cozy mystery, general mystery, and women's fiction all rolled into one. It's a blend of genres, I don't mind that, but the balance seemed a bit strange to me. Anyway, the mystery is okay, it's a good mystery. The start of the mystery felt odd to me as well. I mean, the start of the mystery is all about the main character finds this roll of film, like camera film, old camera film, buried in her garden. Why would you bury this roll of film in a garden to get rid of it, to hide it? Why not just burn it, you know, get rid of it completely? That felt so strange to me. And to use that as a driver, as the first thing that starts the mystery, felt odd to me as well. So even though the mystery itself is okay, that whole start of the mystery just didn't sit right with me. It was odd. I don't think the author made the most of the setting as she could have in this book. It's set in an area in Australia that's very picturesque. So the setting could have been described more, could have been painted more in the story if you like. And that setting is so rich. Why not bring that into the story more? You know, even make that setting feel like a character in a way, because settings like that, if you're living there, because the main character moves there at the start of this book, from the city into this more you know, rural kind of area in the bush. So that change of setting should have made something change in that character as well. You don't get that link sometimes in this story. I then read The Postscript Murders, written by Ali Griffiths. It's the second book in the Harmander Cow series. I like this book a lot. It feels so different from book one. So book one in the series was very dark, almost gothic in atmosphere. This book is more light, more lighthearted as well, and it feels more like a cozy mystery, but cozy mystery in the same kind of subgenre as Richard Osman, that kind of cozy mystery. It's very enjoyable, the mystery is so complex, the characters are brilliant, all the characters. One thing I've found in this series so far is all the characters are written so well. Every character is. Even characters that are there for one book, just written perfectly in my view. It really hooks you into the story straight away. One of the interesting things about this book is the author based the murder victim at the start of the story on her aunt. Not because she wants her aunt to be topped off at all, it's because her aunt would call her up and say things like, I've got a perfect murder for you for your next book. So the author decided to have this elderly character that's in her 80s, I think, in the story when she's murdered. And her job at that time is like a murder consultant. She helps authors come up with murders in their plots to make them feel real, tie all the plots together. That was interesting in the story. And that whole thing about the murder consultant is just linked right through the story. It ties in authors, ties in books, ties in all different things in this book itself. And even characters in this book go to a literary festival in Scotland. So I like everything in the story. I like the way it just ties in kind of like the publishing industry as well. We have authors in scenes. We have festivals going on. We have all different things in this book that tie into a mystery. Very enjoyable. I recommend this book. I recommend the whole series very much. Then I read a horror called The Holy Terrors written by Simon R. Green. It's an arc read for me in January. I enjoyed this book a lot. It's all about this filming of a ghost hunter show for television. You're there when people are making this show. It's like a make or break show for the producers of this show as well, because their viewership is going down. I enjoyed this. I enjoyed the setting. It's very closed off setting, very small footprint. I enjoyed the characters. They're a bit outrageous, a bit quirky, but it makes sense in the story. They blend well. One character who's the producer of this TV show, she's unlikable. She's annoying. So frustrating in the book for the reader and other characters, but she's so engaging because of how she's written. A brilliant character in my view, just so well written in the story. Other characters as well are just well written. It's just a great book to kind of sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride. It makes you wonder as well if the things that are going on are real or not, because 
part of this story is producers telling the people on the show about things that they make up, that are fake, just to get viewers. But then things start happening in this building they're in, and you wonder, is it fake or not? Because the producer and this psychic character as well, who's also kind of like a regular character on the series, they're saying they don't know what's going on. So you just wonder all through the book, is this thing real or not? You know, knocking on the walls, you know, paranormal feeling, is it real or not in the story? Great book in my view. I do recommend it. It's just a fun story. And I'm thinking it's the first book in a series. I have to wait and see. I not, don't know if a second book is coming out or not. If it is, I expect it to be next year or so. But I just like this book a lot. Then I went back to Alice Feeney and I read Good Bad Girl. So this is the third book I read of this author in January. I enjoyed this. It's not brilliant, but it's a very good book. The characters in this book are amazing. For me, the characters are the best part. They're so well written, and they're all very unique. Their dialogue, their actions, their reactions, body language, the way they're written about in the story, they all feel unique to that character. Not all authors can do that very well, in my view. Some authors just do it to a good point, but Alice Feeney has done it to an amazing point in this book. They all feel real. They all feel unique. They just all feel lifelike in this story great characters in this book, and it's all of them, main characters and small characters, all written very well. The mystery is good. It's very twisty, a lot of red herrings, a lot of surprises. Characters as well will surprise you. You have assumptions about characters, and then you'll change your mind based on new information you get as it gradually builds in the story. I like when authors do that in books like this. You don't want kind of a twisty, turny thriller or a mystery to have all the answers up front. Sometimes authors can do that and it still works. I mean, the ride to get there, you know, is enjoyable, is engaging. But in this book, it's all about that, what you don't know, or that gray area, or those assumptions you make. And then this book shocks you because it forces you to change your mind. So a good book, I do recommend it. I do recommend Alice Feeney books more, you know, more recent books than early books. I haven't read all the books by the author yet, I will soon, but so far I've found kind of the more recent books have been better than the early book that I did read. I do like books that are based on TV shows in the TV show universe. So I read Suspicious Minds, written by Gwenda Bond. It's the first book in the Stranger Things universe. Now this book is set, I think, 10 years before the TV show setting. The TV show is set in the 80s. This book is set in the 70s. And it has so many references to the 70s. It kind of feels like you're in that era. We have references to the Vietnam War in a conscription, all that sort of thing. We have pop culture references. We have the attitudes of people at that time as well. That was very good in this book. I didn't think this book was going to be as good as it actually is. And that comes down to, I think, the characters and just how the characters think of themselves and how the characters view societal norms as well because those norms in this book are so well done, very consistent, and it makes you think they're real. One example of that is, is the main character. She says she can't open a bank account in her own name because she's a single woman. And the bank needs her to be married before she can have a bank account. So that just tells you that you're not in modern times. It tells you you're in a part in history where women weren't treated as equals to men in all walks of life. That sort of thing just cements you in that time period. So this book is more kind of sci-fi based, more than horror based. It has the Hawkins lab. The start of this book, the lab is just being built, just completed. And it's all about these characters who are asked to join this study. They don't know what the study is about, but it's like they're pushed to their limits. They're given kind of cocktails of things and they're pushed to the limits and they're kind of almost driven to, not insanity, but they're driven to be something other than themselves, to push to extreme limits in these labs, as happens weekly. Then these characters start to come to understand what's going on more, and they start to rebel a bit. So it has that kind of feel of the TV show. In a TV show, we had these younger kids who are rebelling against this big, you know, this big monster, this big evil. In this book, we have college age kids who are doing the same thing. These kind of strangers, they're brought together and they're forming this kind of group, this club. They're trying to fight against this bigger evil. 
So I enjoyed the story. There are other books in this universe as well. I'm going to try to read them if I can get them, but I did enjoy this one. I then read Past Crimes, written by Jason Pinter, and this is an arc read for me in January as well. This book is a sci-fi, but it's also a cold case mystery and techno thriller. So much going on in this story, and for me, the first half of the book was far better than the second half, but I did enjoy the whole book overall. One thing I liked about this book is the use of tech in the story. It's set in the near future, I think 2037, and the tech side of it is all shiny and bright and new. But the world outside is all dystopian and grey, you know, breaking down, that sort of thing. And that contrast, I think, was well done in the story. And also in this future, cold case mysteries, the cold case industry is the biggest industry on Earth. It's bigger than Disney. It's just massive. You know, it's got everything, even a theme park. And it seems that millions and millions of people around the world are hooked on cold case mysteries. There's cold case VR, there's cold case everything it seems. And in this world, we have big companies. Their sole purpose is to sign deals with survivors of these you know, events going on in real life and getting hold of their life on these contracts and then passing that on to the highest bidder, the company that pays the most to have the rights to these people. And you're signing away everything the right to your image, the right to your thoughts, the right to anything you've ever done in social media, the right to everything to these companies. So they take over your whole life and everything is fair game. So you use as fodder basically if you sign these deals. And they seem to always target people who need the money. And it makes you wonder about the cold case industry. You know, how moral is it? You know, are survivors in these cold cases, how are they treated? they've forgotten about, and they just fodder this industry that's going on now. So I like court cases a lot. I watch them, listen to podcasts, everything. So it does make you wonder about survivors, about that. So I'll still watch cold case in real life. I'll still watch documentaries, TV shows, movies about them. I'll still listen to podcasts about cold cases and read books about them. But I'm going to wonder now more about survivors, about how they're treated by these companies that make all this material about cold cases. Then I read Property of a Lady, written by Sarah Rain. It's a gothic-type haunted house mystery, and is the first book to feature two protagonists, Nell West and Michael Flint. Both these characters are very different, so Nell is an antiques dealer and restorer, and Michael is a professor, I think, at Oxford. They meet kind of by circumstance, because in this book, Michael's friends are inheriting this huge house and they want him to go look at it, try to organize contractors for them to kind of renovate it, get it up to scratch so they can move in. And Nell is an antiques dealer that these friends of Michael's hire to find, you know, furniture that used to be in the house. They want original furniture to go back into the house. Now, I like the way the Gothic feel is built up in this story. It's built up, kind of feels like old school techniques. We have images and shadows the corner of people's eyes. We have knocks and sinister noises. We just have sinister feelings in rooms as well. You know, images that you think of people. You know, all these type of thing going on in the house. And all these occurrences happen at the right moments in the story. And the character reactions are just brilliant. I always think for a gothic atmosphere, you need character reaction. You need strong reactions that feel real. If you don't have that in a story, that atmosphere doesn't build up so much for me. So for me, it built up very well because of little things going on in the scenes in this house, but also the reactions. The mystery is good. It does rely a bit on finding old journals and diaries, a bit too much for my liking. But take that away and the mystery is still solid, very good, and the characters are good as well. So I did enjoy this. I'm going to read the rest of the series, and I did read the second book in this series also in January. I then flipped back to A Cozy Mystery, and I read Agatha Raisin and the Haunted House, written by M.C. Beaton. It's book 14 in this series. Not the best book in this series by far. So for the first 13 books, Agatha Raisin's character was developing well, all these new things being added all the time in the series. In this book, it kind of feels like it's all stripped away. And she's back to how she was in book one, even less so sometimes in this book. And also, we have a new male neighbour in this book. I think it might be the third or fourth new male neighbour she's had in 14 books. That repeats a bit too much for me as well, because each time it happens, Agatha's attracted to him, is trying to 
you know, attract him and try to land him as a boyfriend, basically, or even more in this series. So this seems too much too often so far in the first 14 books in this series. But the mystery is okay. It's not brilliant. The characters are still okay in the story, apart from Agatha. Now, Agatha is still okay as a character in this book, but not as good as she was in previous books. So for me, not the best book in the series, but still, overall, it's a good series. So if you enjoy this series, you'll probably read all the books anyway. And you're going to find in long-running series, especially like this, you're going to have books that are you know, very good, brilliant. You're going to have other books that are just on the lower scale. So even though I didn't enjoy this book a lot, it's still average to me. Staying with Cozy Mysteries, I then read The Unexpected Inheritance of Inspector Chopra, written by Faseem Khan. It's a cozy mystery that's set in Mumbai, India. Now this author, I think he was born in the UK, and he spent about 15 years or so in Mumbai for work. So he doesn't know the area quite well. He knows the whole city and the whole state basically quite well. And I like the way he writes about the city and about the state in general. It seems very genuine, very real. I like his characters in this story a lot. The characters also feel genuine and real. They're also very engaging as well in this story. I like the mystery, how it's set out. And I like how he uses the character, the main character, to visit different parts of the city to drive that mystery forward. You get to see more about the characters in the book and in the city. You get to experience more about the city as well, the settings in the city. You get to really understand how these characters feel about the city as well. So all that plays out very well in the story. I enjoyed it a lot. It's going to make me want to read all the books in this series. I have book two from the library as well to read. I haven't read it yet, but I do want to read the whole series. I enjoyed it a lot. I thought the way he just pictured the city and the people just felt very genuine and real. It just engaged me as a reader because it also felt so different to other cozy mysteries I've read so far. I then read Cockroaches, written by Joe Nesbo, book two in the Harry Holley series. Harry is from Norway, and this series is always touted as being Nordic noir. So you'd think the books would be set in Norway. But they're not. The first two books anyway. This book is set in Thailand. Book one was Australia. Why would you do that? You have a character that's from Norway, an overall series that's always publicised as being Nordic noir, and you set your first two books in countries outside Norway. And they're very different countries, I mean, Australia and Thailand. The feel of those countries is so different. Again, in book two, the author sticks to stereotypes and cliches so often, just like book one. And just Thailand just feels too vibrant, too sunny to be Nordic noir. So it is noir, but not Nordic noir. And that felt strange to me. As I said for book one, you can probably skip this book in the series. If you want to read every book in this series, if you have to, and me, I really have to. So I love to start from book one in a series and read all the way through. If I don't have that sequence in my book reading, it feels odd to me and I may not read the series. So if a series is new to me and I can't find book one at all, I may not start that series at all. So I'm reading from book one all the way through and this book just felt strange to me because it's not that Nordic noir feel that I want from this series. And I feel like that just like book one, you can skip book two as well. If you don't want to read the whole series, skip book one and two and try book three. I then read The Coworker, written by Frida McFannon, and that's the first book from this author that I've read. There are things in this book I really enjoyed, things I didn't enjoy. What I enjoyed is the writing style. It flows so well. You're going to sit back and read it. It doesn't tax you. You enjoy the ride. That writing style is very good. And I wonder if that writing style is in all her books. I hope it is, because I do want to read more by this author. Even though this book's not amazing to me, I do want to read more by the same author. So I enjoyed the writing style, and I also enjoyed kind of the hooks at the start. At the start of this book, we have a great setup, great build of attention and suspense. And that's through one character called Natalie and how she kind of perceives what could have happened to another character called Dawn. So in this book, we start off in an office, and we have Natalie wondering why Dawn hasn't arrived to work, because Dawn's there always, every day, by a certain time. So he's wondering, what's gone wrong? Could something have happened to Dawn? Nobody's heard from her. So he decides to go to Dawn's house for some reason, and she finds blood there. We think something's happened to Dawn. 
that builds up so much tension and suspense. But then we get a bit of past chapters in this story as well. It's not distant past, it's quite recent past. I think based on the last nine, nine months or so in the past life of Dawn, Natalie and other characters in this office. We see different things about the characters. What we assume at the start of the book switches quite quickly. So I enjoyed that. I enjoy having that doubt about characters in the story. But one of the things I didn't enjoy a lot in this story is that Dawn is very consistent as a character at the start. Very consistent and a great character. But then it changes. She has certain things and those things she does. I'm not going to describe what they are because it will give too much away about this book. But things she does, they don't gel with who she is as a character. That didn't make sense to me. And then the conclusion, there are a few twists there at the end that felt just really weird to me. Didn't make sense at all. So overall, it's an average book. There are things there that I love, but things there that aren't done so well. So for me, it's an author I'll still read. I mean, all authors have books you're not going to love. I do want to read certain books by this author because I think there are better books out there. I've seen a few people talk about other books that are great in their view. So I will read more books by the same author, but I hope they're better than this one. I then went back to another arc in January and I read Night Watching, written by Tracy Sierra. This book is just amazing. For a debut book, it's just outstanding. It's a thriller. There is so much tension, suspense building up in this book. So much atmosphere. So much doubt going on in the story as well. There are many twists and surprises. Everything in this book is just laid out so well. I enjoyed it immensely. I'll give you a hint about the start of the book. So at the start of the book, you find out quickly there are no character names. And I enjoyed that in the book. It felt strange to me in the first place, but then I understood why. Because not giving character names means those characters, every character in the story has no name. So all those characters feel more personal. Everything that happens in the book feels more personal. It's like someone telling you what they've experienced. So it feels like it's either a friend or a relative, someone telling you what's happened to them. So it feels more personal. A great choice to make in a book like this. All the characters are named about who they are. So we have the intruder. The intruder is somebody who breaks into this house at the start of the book. We have the mother, we have the daughter, the son. Those characters are in this house at the start of the book. And at the start of the book, they recognize an intruder in the house, and then they're hiding in this small little hidden room in the house. Not a panic room, this small little hidden room in this old house they live in. And the husband isn't in the house at the time. They're just in this tiny room, you know, they can't see the intruder, they can hear him, they can hear him moving around, hear his voice, what he says. So it's all about their fear, their tension, what is happening. I enjoyed that so much at the start of the book. I'm not going to tell you anything else about the book because there are twists and turns, surprises all through the story, revelations about people, about everything in the book just is surprising from that moment on. So grab this book and read it. It's a brilliant book in my view. This book is one to watch, I think, in 2024. I think this author has a great future in books. I can't wait to see more books by this author and read them all because this book was just outstanding in my view. I then read a book that just felt so different to any book I've read before. It's called Delica Dream Department Store. It's written by Miyi Lee. It's a Korean book originally and then being translated into English. But this book is just so surreal. It's like a fantasy book, but it feels different to any book I've read. Basically, we follow a character called Penny. And Penny is interviewing for a job at this department store that sells dreams. And we're based in the City of Dreams, it's called, in this book. This store sells all different types of dreams to people and animals. And I like that in this book. I like animals are included in this book. They come and purchase dreams as well. And you pay for dreams by your emotions. So you have a dream and your emotions you have after the dream are your payments for the dream. And sometimes there are strong emotions. There are rare emotions as well. There are more expensive. And then there's common emotions as well. But the City of Dreams is also feels like just normal life, basically, with a few tweaks. We have these characters. I can't recall the names of the characters, these creatures. But their sole purpose, or their job, is to run around and put robes and clothes on people. Because some people come into the City of Dreams with too few clothes on. So I like that in the story as well. It just adds something to this whole, you know, build up of this world in this book. 
other things going on in this world as well. We have these award nights once a year that feel like the Oscars for people who make dreams. A great addition to a story like this because it just makes the city of dreams feel that much more real. So I enjoy this book a lot. Now, a bit of a warning about this. On the blurb, it says there's a mystery. It says someone steals an expensive dream, a rare dream, and a mystery about who did that and trying to find them. There is a bit of a mystery in this book, but it's very minor. So we have Penny, and someone steals emotions, rare emotions, from her. A vial of them that she's taking to the bank. So it's not an expensive or a rare dream that's stolen, it's these emotions. Then the mystery is forgotten about for the rest of the story, and then mentioned very quickly at the end. So it's not really a mystery fantasy book, just a fantasy book based around dreams. A lot of this book is about the philosophy of dreams. So things like, do you want to know what your dreams were when you wake up? Or are you more interested in just having emotions about those dreams? Things like, do you want to dream about the future or about the past? If you dream about the future, do you want those dreams to be real, about real things in the future? Why do we dream? You know, why do we want good dreams and pleasant dreams? Why do we want dreams at all? All that sort of thing is played out in the story, in discussions between characters. So I like this book a lot, very enjoyable. I think it's the first book in a duology. I am interested in reading the second book. I'm not sure if it's out in English yet or not, but I do want to read the second book in this series. I then read Cozy Mystery, called Bored to Death, written by C.J. Connor. There are two things in this book that I really enjoyed, and I wish that I loved this book more. So it's the first book I read in the cozy mystery genre that has a theme about game shops, you know, board games and tabletop gaming. That was interesting to me. And that whole game shop, that setting, was brilliant in this story. It's kind of small and pokey and, you know, board games kind of here and there and you've got to hunt around for them and they're hidden behind things, under things. That kind of setting about that felt so quirky and so quaint. And I love that setting in the story. And I hope that setting doesn't change because that was one of the best things about this book. The main character is a gay character who's not a stereotype. Another great thing about the book because in so many books, we have gay characters that are stereotypes. And I like the fact that in this book, that character is not. But there are one or two tiny things about the character that I didn't really like that much. He's too jumpy about just normal things. Somebody knocks on a door and he jumps. You know, somebody drops something and he jumps. That was a bit annoying in the story, actually, because it didn't kind of match to who the character is. Also, this character is a bit melodramatic at the strangest times. It doesn't match to who he is in his past. So this character, he's still quite young. I think he's in his early 30s, but he left his teaching job at university. He was a college professor. He left that job to come back home to help care for his father, and his father's just on the onset of an illness, and he's helping his father manage the game shop. So you'd think somebody who was a professor, you know, teaching students, you know, all that sort of thing, wouldn't be melodramatic. But he was in this book, so that doesn't make sense. And also, he's just over shy, he can't talk to people. And that didn't really match to who he would be in that life as a college professor as well, because he'd be in front of students all the time, talking to them, teaching them. So how can a character who's a college professor be so over shy that he can't talk to one person in a game shop, but he can be a professor in college and talk to a classroom full of students? It doesn't really make sense to me in that character build up. So good things about the character, but also things that don't make sense. The mystery overall is a good mystery in the fact that it's got a good bones to it, but it just needs a bit of polish, it needs more red herrings maybe, more twists and turns. It is a bit obvious what's happening in that mystery. So I think overall, this book just needs a bit of polish, it needs a good editor to come in, give it some TLC, because there's good things about this book, and I can see promise, I can see potential in this series, if there's more books in this series, and I do want to read more books in this series if they're published. I then read Masters of Death, written by Olivia Blake. It's a fantasy, a dark fantasy. And I think it's one of those books that are for a certain reader. And I don't know if I'm that reader. I think it's okay as a book. The start of the book, I think, was brilliant. The start of the book hooked me in. It's down to the characters and the setting. But then it just meanders along on just all these different tangents, all these different storylines that, for me, just didn't really hook me in at all. Didn't interest me. 
and towards the end it gets to a conclusion that makes sense but wasn't that gripping as well i just wish that the whole book was about the two characters that were at the start of the book so we have one character who's a real estate agent and also a vampire cat she's trying to sell this house and this house is haunted and this ghost doesn't want the house to be sold so he's doing everything he can to stop the house being sold and this vampire cat character can see the ghost and they can talk and communicate so i like that about the characters i like that setting a lot that whole storyline a lot it was so engaging very gripping those characters were well written then we have other characters coming into the mix and it just felt like we had this whole bunch of characters they're all competing in the book through their dialogue they're all trying to be more outrageous you know more witty than other characters in the story and of course as how it's written this got a bit tiresome for me i don't mind when we have an occasional outrageous character a character is very witty i don't mind that at all but when they're all trying to do that all trying to compete with each other that's how it felt like in the story it gets a bit much and just the whole storyline just began too much it's all about death this story is all about death we have a character who is actual death in this story that character is okay but I think it's a character that's we also trying too hard to make this character a bit edgy. So I think a lot in this book is the author just trying too hard to make this outrageous, make this edgy, to make this in your face. It doesn't work because it's too much. I then read The Sin Eater, written by Sarah Rain, and it's book two in a series that features Nell West and Michael Flint. So these books so far, book one and two, had been paranormal in nature. And this book also involves a kind of haunting, but in a different way. This book is split in past and present narrative and in the past narrative for me it was so gripping the past narrative was so much better than the present day narrative and the reason the present day narrative wasn't that good is because our two protagonists just take a back seat it seems they're not interested in being involved in investigating the mystery that was strange because in book one they were really eager they were just driving forward and that was one of the reasons why book one was so good but in book two they just you know bit complacent about the whole thing they don't kind of care about it it feels like in book two that was odd to me it's still a good book but mainly because of the past narrative I and mean, the characters the setting everything in that past narrative is brilliant and we learn so much about the kind of the haunting aspect the history of it in that past narrative as well there are some good twists and turns in this story you make assumptions early on those assumptions are tested so i like that happening in the book as well those twists and turns are so surprising they kind of knock you between the eyes a bit when they happen in the story so i like that in the book as well so overall the book's got a good structure but i just wish those two main characters were just more eager in that book to just investigate this whole mystery because without that the book does suffer a bit i then read still life written by louise penny it's the first book to feature chief inspector amon gamash first book in a series and i enjoyed this a lot it's also one of the 12 books that were chosen for me to read this year so being the first book in a series and being that i liked it so much i'm gonna to have to read the rest of the series so another series to add to my list but i enjoyed so many things about this book i enjoy the setting so much i enjoy the characters all the characters are brilliant all of them i enjoy how our main character is so different to that stereotype you see in many crime novels so different so i enjoy so many things about this story the writing style feels a bit quaint in a way a bit gentle you can kind of get a sense by reading this the author cares so much about the whole book about the characters about the setting about everything there's so much about the author i think in this book it feels like this is kind of personal to the author as well i enjoy everything about this book i loved it i recommend this a lot if you've not read this series at all start with this book it's a great introduction to the series and the main character so i do like my books based on tv shows there's a tv show called librarians i've not seen it yet i've heard about it i want to watch it this book is based on that show it's called librarians and the lost lamp and it's written by greg cox it's a great book in my view and i don't think you need to see the show first to read and enjoy this book the characters are drawn so well in this story all the characters are so engaging this one is split in past and present narrative in the past narrative it's 10 years before the present narrative and it involves librarians basically so this group of librarians in the past narrative it's only one librarian in the present narrative i think there's four or five of them but their purpose is to protect humanity from magical artifacts 
For something happened, some secret group on the evil side of things. They let loose this magic back into the world. So we have artifacts back in the world that have magical properties. And librarians, who have been around for centuries, the organisation has anyway. Their purpose is to find the artifacts, take them back to their headquarters and store them away and keep them away from people and protect the world, basically. It's all about Aladdin's lamp in this book. The past narrative and the present narrative about the same lamp. And it ties in very well between the two narratives. I enjoyed this a lot. There's adventure, there's daring, there's fantasy, there's magic, but it's also history and geography. And a lot of this book takes place in other countries, and I like the fact we get great geography and history about those countries as well. Kind of real history and real geography about them. I like the urban fantasy side, I like the characters, I like the mystery, I like the adventure. Everything about this book, I think, is just so well done. I enjoyed it a lot. I then read Dead Again, written by Sandy Wallace, and it's the book two in the series that features Georgie Harvey and John Franklin. This book is set in rural Victoria in Australia, and I like that. I like the fact we have this crime series set in rural settings, and we have real towns in this book as well. Well, in this book, we have a real town, we have a fake town, but set in kind of an area that had real events going on, if that makes sense. Like book two in this book, the two main characters, they're investigating different cases, and then they merge a bit later on in the story. So like book two, it has the same feel. And also other things about book two, the way it plays out, happened in book one. So for me, that felt strange. I didn't really enjoy that part of it because I want something a bit different. I don't mind that we have two main characters investigating two cases, but just make it different. We don't have to have the same overall plot structure that we had in book one. The cases are very different. Georgie Harvey is now a journalist and she's been asked to write an article, a feature article about a community two years after a wildfire, and a wildfire that devastated the community. You know, a lot of people died in the fire, and buildings destroyed, and they're rebuilding still. John Franklin's case is totally different. It's all about a series of break-ins and robberies and vandalism going on in his town. But we have a tie-in. I'm not going to say what the tie-in is, but there's a tie-in between both cases later on in the story. And also in this book, kind of on the more personal side, the more cosy side, because Georgie Harvey's timeline is more like a cosy mystery than anything else. She's broken up with her boyfriend, and in book one, there was this kind of attraction going on between her and John Franklin. And in book two, that continues and progresses. So on the more personal side, there's development as well. And then we have some mysteries that are very interesting, I think, in the book as well. So overall, the good book. I just wish that plot structure was a bit different than book one. The last book of the month, and you're probably thinking, thank goodness, I got to the last book of the month finally. It's called Bleeding Heart Yard, written by Ellie Griffiths. It's book three in a series to feature Harvinder Core. I enjoy this book a lot. I enjoy the whole series. And this book has a different feel to the first two books in a series. So book one in the series was more dark, almost gothic. Book two was you know, more vibrant and light, more like a cosy mystery, like a Richard Osman book. This book is more like a classic mystery. It's a crime book, of course, but the mystery element is so well done. A split in past and present narrative, and that past narrative features characters in the present narrative, all of them. And they're all friends from the past. Not so closely friends in the present narrative, but they're all in the same area in the present narrative for this book anyway. I like in this book also how we have a police officer as a suspect. Very early on in the book, that officer becomes a suspect. That's good because it opens up different kind of avenues for character growth and development in the story. Also in this book, our main character, Harbinder, she's now moved to London, so a change of setting. And also, she's now the head of a crime unit, so a change of position. I like how the character develops in the book because we get to see how she thinks about people who report to her. It's interesting how she views them, also how she kind of judges them sometimes as well. That's interesting because she's a character who doesn't like to be judged herself, but she judges other people. So it's interesting how that plays out in the story. But like every other book in this series so far, all the characters are brilliant, even small characters. The mystery is very strong, very twisty, turny and surprising. There's great things going on in this story. I think a change of setting sometimes like this in a series, this dramatic change of setting, 
doesn't work sometimes, but in this book it works very well. And it's down to, I think, just the way it's written, down to the character as well, the characters developing in that setting. We get to see that growth in the character as this book progresses as well. It's not like a sudden jolt. We have a bit of a change, but it feels more gradual because we settle into this setting as the character does as well. So I like that in the book. I like the whole book. Very enjoyable, great mystery. I can't wait to read more books in this series. There you have all the books I've read in January. This has been a very long video, many books discussed. For all the books I mention in this video, I'll have a book review on my channel, a longer version, should already be there for some books, and in the future for other books. If you're interested in those videos, check out my channel and subscribe. On my channel, I review books from all different genres. Check out my channel and subscribe. On the screen now is a link to a video for another book I'm sure you'll enjoy.